Hey, welcome to the 131st episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Stephen Helliker, Christopher Weil, and Clinton Cornwell, all three of who I met at the live show. I am Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Edlow. Today we're talking to Bill Kiley. He's got a new feature coming out called Age of Summer. It's a beautiful slice of life story about a young boy who joins the junior lifeguards and kind of comes of age and falls in love with the ocean and also a beguiling young woman. I saw a YouTube review of the movie and the guy said, it's like Kings of Summer meets Baywatch, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, really thoughtful conversation with Bill. Bill's been through the trenches. He started in advertising and did a ton of action sports, snowboarding, s- surfing kind of lifestyle videos. He directed a ton of stuff for Vans, Off the Wall Tour and everything. And he also produced a bunch of movies. And he's worked. he owns the company, Window Seat, that I used to work for. So if you want to learn what it takes to combine the passions of action sports and producing and uh, career directing into your first feature, Bill kind of nailed it. Well, awesome. Well, before we dive in with Bill, uh, I want to give a quick disclaimer. I've been incredibly sick for the past nine days. My voice, I, I sound like I'm a duck to myself. But I don't know what you all will think. But I do want to apologize for my very strange, uncomfortable voice. I think it's funny that I sounded so much worse in previous episodes. I don't think I was dying. I'll have to disagree. I think you sound great at all times. Well, great. Okay. I'll take it. Well, before we hop into our conversation with Bill, it's kind of been a while, Oren. Uh, We had the live show. We've been recording a ton of like super long interviews. So we've been skipping my very favorite segment. Oren, tell me, what have you been working on lately? Well, I've been just pitching a lot lately. I worked on my friend's true crime show for Snapchat, which was really fun. It was a uh, vertical. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had I'm shooting some spots at Disney World, Walt Disney World, and I'm going to go scout next week. And I had to like change my entire schedule because I got this other amazing offer, and I changed my flights. I told the production they didn't have to worry about flying me anymore. And then I ended up last minute not like the the talent in this other job I got decided they wanted to use their friend to direct. So I lost that job after I'd like worked my entire life around it. And now I have a one-way ticket to Orlando and no way to get back. Um, are you going to go to Disney World for real? Are you going to do anything? I hope so. I I don't know. They, so I'm, it's crazy. So I live in LA. I'm going to fly to Orlando to scout this place. I get in Sunday night and they scheduled the scout for 6 a.m. on Monday, which is 3 a.m. our time, which means I have to wake up at like 2 a.m. our time, which is usually the time I go to sleep. So I told them I'm going to be like totally brain dead at the scout and like a zombie. Uh, So sure, I might be on a ride and not even realize it, but probably just walking around will be like, a turbulent enough, enough yeah. experience for maybe, me. Maybe take a segue. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I think that, you know, when you travel for work, you I always joke I've been to Atlanta a few times and it's I've only been to the soundstage, my hotel and the airport. Like I went to a pancake place and that was really nice. Uh, and I've been there multiple times. But so Disney World is like the funniest place to fly there multiple times and not do any of the touristy things because literally all there is to do is touristy things. Yeah, no, it is an interesting question. I flew there once for uh, the Florida Film Festival, which I highly recommend. It's in Maitland, Florida, which is right outside of Orlando. Uh, And on the flight, it was like me and a bunch of kids. And I was like, I couldn't figure out why for a while until like the, you know, flight attendant was like, hey, who here is going to Disney World? And everyone's like, what? Like screaming. It's like, uh oh, I am a long flight. Did you know I kind of love Disneyland? You know, I don't know if I knew that. Maybe I knew. Everyone likes Disneyland. It's well, like, yeah, but I, have, I have an annual pass is what I'm telling you. Right now you have an annual mm-hmm. pass? Yeah. No, you while. don't. Yeah, you want to see? Then you would know it's called the passport. Uh, annual pass. Uh, AP, so they send you a bumper <laughs> sticker and that's not a joke. Wait, you have an annual pass? Yeah, bro. Why have you never gone to Disneyland since I've known you and you have um, I just pass? I'm a grown man who goes to Disneyland so I don't say it every time I go because that would be weirder. Wait, so when you tell me you're busy and you can't do something like upload an episode for our listeners, it's cuz you're at Disneyland? Um no, that's when I'm working. 
Matthew Enlow. Your real name is Matthew. <laughs> oh my God. He's looking at my uh, annual pass. Yeah. Learning all sorts of things about you. So I am, um, I, I like going to Disneyland much more than I like watching Disney movies. Wait, how much does that cost? It's a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. By a couple, you mean two? Or uh, like a few hundred dollars? This is the Southern California pass. So most of the year is blocked out. It's actually yeah. really convenient because like my wife doesn't have a, uh, a regular job either. So we can kind of set our own schedules. The big pass is a thousand dollars. Yeah. It's that is not. So I think uh, this one, I think is two fifty. You just have to go twice and it pays for itself. Right. And so the real advantage, the reason I like Disney, the way I learned to like Disneyland is um, when friends would come down, they'd want to go. And back in, when I was in college, it was, annual pass was $99. And so rather than buy a pass every time you had friends come down, I'd just like get the pass and then go meet them for the afternoon and not feel stressed out about how you have to go on every single ride or like right. whatever it do is. Do the park. Do the park, yeah. There's been many, many times where I've gone to Disneyland and not gone on a single ride, and those are my most favorite times. Wow. Well, I don't know if you know this, but I was also a previous annual pass holder for many years. I didn't know All that. through high school. I would go there after school. Yeah, see, so that's the thing. This I know this is not about filmmaking. Apologies, everyone. But um, this is... The culture of Disneyland is the thing that's interesting and fun to me beyond um, the uh, actual movies or even rides that are affiliated. I think there's something interesting about teen culture being so specific and preserved and Southern California culture and all that stuff is kind of mixed into this weird multimedia art project. And then also you can pretend to be in Star Wars for 10 minutes. It's yeah. pretty great. No, it's awesome. I did see... Coco, though, yesterday. Have you seen oh, that yeah, movie? sure. It's great. Everyone's like, oh, you're going to cry at the end. And I was like, so worried it would be for a sad reason, but it was like kind of for a, yeah, it's a heartwarming yeah. reason. The the skin on the grandma character is so, so good. good. Yeah. Yeah. It's like wispy and so- it feels soft. Yeah. Um, reminds me of a real chicken. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, cool. So, what have you been working on lately? Yeah. So, um, we, yeah, we haven't talked about my stuff in a while. So, I am on a new Facebook watch show for a company called Attention, A T T N, um, which is like Fox or now this. It's one of those Facebook primarily video news uh, and media sites where, you know, you'll see a lot of explainer videos and things like that. Facebook had a show with them, I started a show with them. I came in to replace the old showrunner, basically, who uh, who left. So um, it's been a real adventure of like kind of making the show my own, kind of getting handed everything midstream. You know, we were on episode eight when I started out of 17. It's been a full sprint. It's been pretty nonstop. So Orin, you were joking about not having time to upload episodes, but that literally... I have made that mistake once or twice. Basically. Yeah, at the because live show, everyone's like, so what's going on? Uh, it's Thursday, and there's no episode up. <laughs> Did people say that to you? Yeah, someone was like, uh, I usually listen to your epi- your show on my way to work, and I couldn't today. Yeah, sorry. Apologies. But that's cool that people are used to the regular releases of the show. Um, so how many episodes do you have left? Um, we have nine left. Yeah. Okay. For you listeners at home, I feel like I've totally lost Matt over the last month because he's been so busy on this show. Yeah. Well, and I was in Kentucky before that. So I went straight from Kentucky into the show and then I was in a wedding. And so weddings kind of take, so I basically didn't have any weekends for a, a decent amount of time. So this is the first week where I feel like we're back. I'm, I'm into a groove now where like I, We've hired out a, a writer's room and my graphics team and, you know, there's a lot of different moving parts. I kind of am bouncing between the suits and post and production and writers all day, kind of in a little cycle like that. So, um, but it's been great and we're kind of, I'm getting to up the production values in ways that are exciting and fun. And um, yeah, I feel like the show is getting better and better, which is nice. Awesome. Well, we can't. I can't wait to check it out. Attn. Yeah, it's, go, it's called uh, Undivided Attention is the name of the show. You can check it out on Facebook Watch. Uh, we just had an episode launch. Oh, cool. Um, the interesting thing is there's been a little bit of a crossfade between the old re- old regime and what I'm trying to do. So there's a little bit of uh, an adjustment period where 
the last couple episodes, I didn't have any hand in writing really, and or sometimes even shooting all of the pieces. And this first episode that just aired is one where I did directed it soup to nuts. So I started with the script and kind of reshaped it a little bit, and then you know kind of added my own flair to it. So uh, I, I'm and kind are you of proud suggesting of it. it's the best one. I can suggest wholeheartedly that it is my favorite. Um, I think it maybe yeah you know. No disrespect to the previous regime, but um, it's more my taste. I would expect it to be, right? <laughs> right. Cool. It's yeah. more autobiographical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about me. Yeah, they're all about me. Nice. Uh, well, cool. Well, before we get into talking to Bill, just want to remind everyone that we have a Patreon. The URL is patreon.com slash just shoot a pod. It's a place where you can give a couple bucks a month to help support the podcast, help us put on live shows like we just did last yeah. week, which yeah. was a wild success. Yeah, basically our patrons bought everybody the beer that we served for free. So patrons, you are you get to brag to everybody. Yeah, and uh, you help us pay our editors, Jay and Chris, and it uh, just helps us keep the show going. So check it out, patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. We appreciate everyone. Yeah, let's uh, hop into our conversation with Bill. Okay, Bill Kiley in the house. <laughs> Make you, some noise. Or Bill yeah. Keeley on Film Week, Larry Mantle called you Bill Keeley. Oh, wait, holy man, that that's awesome. That's Le- was, the Larry Mantle, <laughs> yes, the guy who had a sandwich oh, named after him, Bill Keeley, <laughs> with his oh, film. He's a little soft. Wow, well, this is so incredible. Um, for non LA natives, Larry Mantle is like kind of like the local NPR affiliate host, and he on Fridays does Film Week. I highly, re- I think I endorsed once upon a time. They do an Oscar roundup where they get a ton of LA critics to all talk about the Oscar contenders. So Larry Mantle is a real delight. Um, Los Angeles treasure. And when I had an office job, we would refer to it as Larry Mantle late. If you were in, if you got an after 11, I think is when his time slot starts. So oh, like if you, you heard his, if, if you, show if on you, the you way heard to the Larry Mantle on the way to the office, you were real, real late. Yeah. No, I, when I saw that, your that your movie Age of Summer was on Film Week. I was like, wow, that's to me that's like the Sundance of LA. Is that- I mean, it genuinely is a, like a a really cool special thing. So yeah, congrats, man. Thanks, guys. Yeah, but he did mispronounce your name. I'm used to that. <laughs> yeah, K I E L Y Keely. Um, Bill, tell us uh, about your movie. The title is Age of Summer, and it's a coming of age story about a boy's first summer on the beach. It's a lot of surfing. It's very kind of, it's a period piece. It is. It's kind of like, um, got that kind of Kodachrome, primary colors, beachy Southern California feel, right? And was it, did it take place in 1986 or 1983? I saw there's well, a big controversy on the internet. Yeah, LA Times bit into me on that one. <laughs> um, originally it was 1983. And then when we started putting the soundtrack together, some of the songs were from 1986. And, um, Dan Wilcox insisted that I make it 1986. Is that the editor? The um, music supervisor. Oh, music supervisor. He also is at NPR. Dan's awesome, uh, but I did not go back and change the mouse type on the newspaper that shows (laughs) up later that says 1983. Uh, I know a good VFX guy who could take care of that for you. You know, that's the thing. (laughs) Such a bummer. But anyway, a little, you know details that someday someone will laugh about it's so dumb because the la times is like uh how hard is it to write the right date on the newspaper if it takes place in 1986 why does it say 1983 on the newspaper i was like that is a really dumb thing to like call you out on wait who who was the critic do you remember i'm not sure of his name i it was not justin chang is it no but he reviewed Uh, my movie oh really he called the score saccharin i was just telling bill earlier (laughs) well he's also a film week regular so that's why i'd be excited i do like him though is that how um you it sounds like you're getting a, a ton of great great press um is that through personal connections is that through just like an aggressive pr campaign how did you kind of get the word out because i mean i'm teasing but film week is you know, a big NPR show. There's, you know, this market is huge. And then obviously LA times reviews are, um, you know, lifetime achievements. You know? Right. And it used to be that if you had a movie in the theaters, you'd get an automatic review from LA times, but they canceled that, stopped doing that yeah. like a few years ago. By the way, the reviewer was Michael Rechtschaffen. 
And his uh, he's not on film week, as far as I remember. And what he wrote is, do you mind if I read this out loud? Go Bill? for Sorry, it. it's just so dumb. A greater attention to technical details would have been preferable, despite establishing that 1986 setting. Later in the film, there's a close-up of a just-published newspaper with a clearly visible 1983 dateline. While memory can play fast and loose with time and place, it's nothing a dab of whiteout couldn't have easily fixed. I That's just, how the review ends. I really, I just want to take critics who nitpick things like that and just have, watch them make one movie, just one day's worth of shooting. Genuinely, I feel like they would never say something so annoying ever again. There's one thing about it that I liked. It means you watch the movie really closely. Sure, that's true. So, yeah, uh, you know, it was Eagle like eye. almost like he's nodding to me that he watched it. Um, but it, yeah, I couldn't believe that that's the way they ended it. And for full disclosure, I did do the VFX on this movie. Oh. There weren't that many of them. But if Bill would have said like, "Hey, can you change this date?" I would have been like, "No one will ever notice this in a million years." <laughs> it's such a funny thing because I figured if I didn't you know i figured the music community the way dan painted it was if i didn't change it then the music community would say that some of these songs are later than 83 sure. but yeah oh well, you know it's silly it's a bummer that that's what ended up being in the newspaper but, but live and learn uh, the answer to your question is i have a pr company mm-hmm. and uh they came through the distribution company and like you hired a pr company we did, yeah, and um, they, they, uh, the initial word that came from LA Times was they weren't going to review the film because they lost a lot of reporters, and you know, newspaper mm-hmm. reporting is not what it used to be t- sure. as far as their bandwidth. And then they, uh, c- they came back with the news they were going to re- review it, and I think that caused a couple dominoes to fall. Yeah, I mean, and, I think that's a, that's an interesting point. Getting a big nationally recognized publication like that to pay attention to your movie must mean that you know you're bona fide in a certain sense, right? Like other publications know that it's worth taking a look at as well. I like the way you're talking about <laughs> this. I mean, it's all really recent. It was all in the last week, so I'm still, um, you know, kind of trying to catch up. Sure. In three years of doing this podcast, I think this might be our first time having a guest on whose movie literally came out like four days ago or something. Yeah. Yeah. Normally Um, we're like right beforehand. So like we don't, this is an interesting (laughs) kind of. Yeah, uh, you're getting the life cycle. Yeah. Yeah. You're reading the reviews. You're seeing, you're like on Rotten Tomatoes. You're in the press. You're in social media. It's like you're in the, the thick of it. You just premiered on Thursday night and it's, um, it's emotion. It's like you know when you. It, it's way different than when you put like a big video on YouTube, but mm-hmm. you're just glued to your computer, just like googling and reading, mm-hmm. and the, your heart is like racing. And every word someone says, like literally, some kid, eight year old kid, writes a comment and is like, "That looks not that good." You're and like, they have no <laughs> idea that the filmmaker is actually going to read it, and then we're reading all of them. Is there a specific site or? Is there like a place that you kind of find yourself gravitating to that your curiosity is kind of like you find yourself revisiting and refreshing that? Yeah, YouTube with the trailer for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's where there's been the most interaction with real people. Mm -hmm. And um, we we sat on this project for quite a bit and not any longer than any other feature, but I was real curious to see how people would receive it. Mm -hmm. Those same comments will probably come through the different VOD platforms, but Mm -hmm. initially when we put the trailer out, it was fun to see the reaction. So walk us through um, the, we'll, maybe we'll kind of go um, front to back, basically. Walk us through the life cycle of the distribution of the film. So like, did you have a festival premiere or did you go directly into theatrical release? We went directly into theatrical. I hoped that this movie would get into a top tier festival and didn't. Um, I, I kind of understand why it didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and why would you say that is? It's not an issue film. Mm-hmm. It's um, there's nothing political or gender or sure race, and so it's not really um, challenging in a, in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. It's, that, um, it's not noisy, as they like to say sometimes. Maybe I like that. And you know, you hear about they have nine thousand films to watch, and um, so I, I kind of understood why it didn't didn't make you know it frustrated me as a filmmaker um and we had done a film the bachelors Mm -hmm. uh that came out last year and we went with freestyle distribution again the company that did that one Mm -hmm. and when you say we you were a producer on that film i was so do you say i was or i am 
These or things that exist forever. I mean, I are. yeah. And that was a movie with J.K. Simmons, but you didn't direct it. No, I didn't. It's a project that came to your company and you decided to, you liked it. Yeah, co-production. Yeah. Which I want to, I don't know if this is a good time to segue into that. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. I want to talk about like what projects you like, like what oh, gets you excited about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's circle back to that. That's great. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So then, so basically you leveraged, uh, basically you leveraged the, Relationships that you'd had from all of the experience making these other movies as a producer to say, okay, like I'm going to work with these people that we have a great track record with. They'll just release it directly then. Yeah, they, you know, there's no easy answer right now with film distribution. Sure. We wanted transparency. We wanted to be able to really understand the process and the numbers and, and feel good about the film, you know, six months, a year from now. Mm -hmm. And Freestyle is good about that. There are other companies we could have gone with where uh, we just kind of have to let go of our baby and it goes off in this other world and we kind of, you know, have our fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. um, so with Freestyle, we have a relationship, kind of know where it's going to go. And um, and there's like literally a call every week, which is like, hey, what, you know, how many views did the trailer get? Like, what are we doing on social media? What are we doing on PR? Yeah, like, how can we boost this? Like, what? What? Yeah, interesting. That's great. they were they were aggressive. We wanted to release the movie this summer, and the other companies I was talking to were like, "No, no, no we'll release it in 2019." And I wanted to be finished with it and get on to the next project. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, cool. And then uh, remind me, um, what is the release uh, schedule like? Are you doing a theatrical run? Is it? Yeah, we did a. Um, day and date. Great. So we we're in the theater right now, and at the end of this week we'll be out of it. But it was ten cities, mm -hmm. ten markets mm -hmm. um, for a week, and then we're on in the same day. We're on iTunes and Hulu and Amazon and Direct TV. So listeners could watch it right now if they wanted to. They could jump on it right now. <laughs> so, well, so everybody Bill pause, go watch the movie, and then come back. <laughs> well, so Bill and I have had a lot of debates about this, and I mean he's kind of been like a one man. Uh, battering ram against like every traditional movie release person, like the PR people, the social people, the distributors. Bill's theory is that his so his movie is a coming of age movie. It's about a fifteen year old kid. Thir how old is? We don't say the age. And he, you know, teenager. He's about what's about fifteen. Yeah, sure. Um, he's a teenager that just moved to uh, Marina del Rey. No, nope. Hermosa Beach. <laughs> yeah, it's about a boy who who <laughs> moves with his family from the Midwest to the beach, and his mind's kind of blown by mm -hmm. the ocean, and the beauty of it all, and the uh, and it's it's basically his first summer on the beach, and he gets into the junior lifeguards, which mm -hmm. is a co-ed lifeguard training program, which you did as a kid too. I did. Did yeah. you have your mind blown by the ocean at fifteen? Or so. I fell in love with it. This movie for me was about falling in love with the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, to go deeper, I'm really concerned with the state of the ocean right now. And, mm -hmm. and um, rather than make a documentary about plastics and stuff like that, I wanted to. I'm into feature filmmaking and wanted to make a movie about how I fell in love with the ocean. And if more people could see the beauty that I see in the the ocean, if we could capture the spirit of that, maybe some of them would get more excited about it and take care of it. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think. The reviews across the board kind of acknowledge that, like mm -hmm. that this is like kind of makes the ocean like a beautiful and this like kind of big character, and it's just yeah, like, in the way say in the same way that like New York or Los Angeles are characters in movies, the ocean. Yeah, it's a really good point. I wanted, I really, I as a filmmaker, I feel like yeah, your locations can become characters too, right? And um, the ocean is is the is he falls he he notices girls in the ocean, falls mm -hmm. in love with both of them equally and i think there's a language that goes along with the ocean that a lot of people don't understand and mm -hmm. i try to tune into that a little bit there's there's rhythms and stuff that if you don't live on the coast you don't really get and we try to there's a lot of water cinematography in the movie where it's slowed down and you really can take a look at the way the, the water's moving and stuff and if you're into that which some people are and they're responding to it um it, it speaks to you yeah. yeah and bill is a bona fide surfer his buddies with like you know Kelly Slater and all those guys. I, I'm, I've spent the 2000s uh, filming surfing in for Vans Shoe Company. Oh, right on. That's cool, and, man. Yeah. the I'm a lifelong Vans wearer. I'm slip-ons today. Yeah. And I yeah. use Vans to uh, kidnap people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, 
I want making the first feature. I wanted to take advantage of some of my strengths and be, and I like being on the beach and I can, and I understand water cinematography and I understand how to shoot in the mm-hmm. sand and yeah. stuff that other people do not want to do. Mm-hmm. So I figured if we did that, maybe we'd get a little advantage. So because this movie is kind of a coming of age story about a young guy, the main actor, Percy Hines White is on that show, the gifted, that X-Men show on Fox. Um, and there's a girl on it, Brianna Salaz, Salaz, how do you say her last name? Salaz. Salaz. She was on The Voice, on Team Gwen. There's like kind of a very kind of like youthful angle through the casting, through the mm-hmm. vibrant colors and stuff. And like yeah, definitely. And look, the colors are so great. But like just a, a lifeguard uniform and blue water. Like that's right. just and so the primal. brown sand. Yeah. Kind of like beige sand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so that combination really, you know, I think Bill felt like appeals to young people. And so your theory, sorry, I'm just speaking out of no, turn here, but uh, your theory is that a young person will see a trailer, want to know, oh, this movie looks cool. How can I watch it now? And if they can't watch it now, they will forget about it in like I five minutes. I 1,000% agree with that. Yeah, the game's changed. I think if with this day and date thing, you know, the internet paves over itself every night, you know, mm-hmm. and so it's fantastic to be able to communicate with my audience or with our audiences so easily through social media, but the traditional model of like stoking the fire a month before the movie comes out really doesn't work for a small independent movie. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of, you know, pushing back on the PR and pushing back on social media teams and saying, look, if there's no product to buy right now, let's wait until the last minute to promote this movie. Cause we don't have a huge amount of money or anything, you know? And so it's, so it's really fresh. And so they can literally go and click through and decide to purchase the movie. It's, it's real easy now to just make the transaction happen. But that like anticipation thing that's you know mm-hmm. traditionally the way they market movies i don't think it works for a movie of this size there's too much good stuff out there right right well so i guess the counterpoint and something that we've also talked a lot about is like if someone sees a trailer for a movie if i see a trailer for a movie i want to google it see what the rotten tomato says what you know look at imdb see what actors are in it like i want to see the presence that this movie has and if i google a movie and nothing comes up then does that make me want to see the movie less? Like, I feel like it's less of a real movie, right? Do you, would you sure. agree? Yeah. That I you mean, need to create a history of the movie before it comes out so that you're, you're mm-hmm. uh, attacking people on all sides and, you know, that whole idea of, like, multiple impressions and hopefully you see this trailer, like, ten times or this ad ten times before you go decide to buy the movie. I think the learning for me was, and it was something my sister Whitney was aggressive about with me and I did not take enough advantage of it was... That when you're making a movie, do lots of social media Mm -hmm. and then continue it through the post process and continue it through the, the, um, Gobi desert phase of the, of movie making where you're trying to get it finished so that you really have a lot of stuff to cherry pick from. And so you've built up a good audience the whole time. Don't wait until the release to try to grab thousands of eyeballs that would have liked your content. Go, go after them the whole time and you'll be in a better place when it's time to release the movie. Did you ever do the AMA? The Reddit AMA? I haven't, but I I still look at all the things we talked about as valid for the next month and a half. And the way the Mm -hmm. deal we made is we're in a premium window on iTunes and uh, these different places. And it's not about the first week. It's about really trying to stretch that period where you're you're still on the stove as long as possible. Right. I I guess there is like a little bit of um, trying to spike that algorithm early on, right? Like those pre-orders and those you know th- that initial weekend clutch window kind of keeps that tail that long tail quote unquote um to be a little more fruitful but yeah i agree for sure um netflix does a great job of like they'll email you like hey <clears throat> we think this show you're gonna like is gonna come out mm-hmm. at the end of the month and then the day it comes out they email you hey tonight watch this show yeah so it's like i think that two-prong approach is just like really important and i I do personally think the trailer has to be the first thing that comes out before the movie because it's it's literally the best example of what your movie is going to be like. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a chicken and, and an egg thing, right? Because I think that, you know, in building an audience, the tr- spiking a trailer and spiking the algorithm for a trailer on, say, YouTube or wherever you end up posting it, that is also going to be a big first step, right? So, like, if you've built if you've managed to like kind of dovetail all of the different audiences from all of your talent and all of that, 
the different wells that you can draw from early on, get them all in one place and ready for the trailer. That's kind of the first big step. Um, but your point, Bill, is like, if you don't have any content, then when you get those eyeballs, you know, especially if there's an ad spent behind it, but even if it's just your talent's only going to post about your movie so many times, right? There's just a, a very fine balance that you have to hit, you know? Well, something we talked about is like, making custom things for each actor. Like let's get a cool clip or make a meme for the main actor and have him post that on his Instagram. And even like Peter Stormare, who's in the movie has a, a really good part, but you know, it's relatively mm-hmm. short, like giving him something cause he's people know him, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's really fascinating. And I am curious to see how it all plays out. I don't know if anyone's like keeping track of all the statistics. Obviously the PR company keeps track of all the PR and the social people will probably like make up some numbers about how everything's performing. They're yeah. really excited about their numbers. I'm really excited for this film to find its audience. And that's mm-hmm. what excites me about social media now is that the primary, you know, sweet spot for this film would be the coastal regions of the, mm-hmm. the country. And um, they're reachable with these hashtags. It takes a, it takes a little while. Um, but you know, the, the social media company is excited about the amount the number of impressions they're getting. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out if they're the right, I don't know if they're the right people, the, what the feedback that I'm getting doesn't really tell me if they're the right people. But yeah, the challenge for me is keeping it alive through this, um, at least for a month, keeping it really warm, you mm-hmm. know? Well, one thing that's gotten the trailer a lot of views is there's, I mean, there's this like beautiful imagery of like kind of good looking people in bathing suits, right? It's not in any way like pandering or, I mean, it's very authentic yeah. to the time, but uh, it is something like when I think of a movie idea, I always try to think of like what the trailer is going to be. Um, and then like thinking about why that trailer would draw people, um, especially visually is like something that's like good to keep in mind when you're pitching a, someone a movie mm-hmm. and the trailer kind of sucks or like the most interesting thing about your movie is a secret that's revealed halfway through the movie that can't be in the trailer. Um, you know, to me, that's like a, not a good pitch. Um, yeah, it was humorous to see the way different people picked up, picked the uh, cover image for the the trailer, and you know they sure right because most most of the postings of the trailer on YouTube are not ones that came from you; they came from people that picked up the trailer. Yeah, only one of them came from us, and then it just people went went off with it, which is cool, which is what you want to happen. Mm-hmm. But it was interesting to see the different way they interpreted the the uh, the image that they represented the trailer with. Mm. So let's rewind just for a second to like the origin of this movie. You've been, you know, you just mentioned that you had filmed stuff for vans back in the day, did a ton of surfing stuff, skate stuff, commercials, stuff for the military. You've been, you've had this company, you've produced films, you've been in the business for a long time. Always kind of, I guess, from the way I see you as like primarily like as a director with a creative vision, but also like helping shepherd other projects. Um, Like, so what, why did it take until now for you to do your first feature? I, you know, when I was in college, I wanted to do film and I didn't know how to do it because I wasn't living in Hollywood or didn't have any family members here. So I got into advertising. I put an advertising portfolio together, got a, got my first job at a place called gsd and an advertising agency in Austin, Texas. And they said they would let me do TV commercials, which is what I wanted to do. So I thought that was like a really good way to get to do music videos and then maybe movies. Right, Fincher and, uh, style. Yeah, I mean, that was the Fincher era, you know, Spike mm-hmm. Jones, Fincher. Um, Gondry. Yeah, all those dudes. Yeah, that was the model, right? It was uh, Matt actually interned? For yeah. Propaganda? I would, no, Roman I wish, Coppola? Uh, yeah, the Directors Bureau. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but my manager, Larry Shapiro, uh, got to start at Propaganda. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was like bumming around there um, and AD'd for them for a long time. Yeah, I, I was a, I knew the dudes at Propaganda and was going when I was going to Art Center. I was going to hang out at the Propaganda parties and thought that was sure, a pretty sure. cool scene. Uh, Art Center big graduates Michael Bay, right? And who mm-hmm. else? Somebody there's somebody else like Aren't super there Pixar fun. people that went there. Went to Art Center, you're thinking Cal Arts. Oh yeah, Cal Arts. Sorry. There's a <laughs> there's a there's a couple other like namey Joseph, Joseph Kahn maybe. Yeah, oh, he yeah, seems yeah. like an Art Center guy. Fast yeah. and Furious dudes. Art Center was really cool. Yeah. I mean, really inspiring place to be. The film program was really hands-on. I went there because you get to, like, check out a camera, and everyone kind of needs it as much as you do. So, cool place. But, yeah, Propaganda was the 
was killing it. And so I thought that would be a way to get to do films maybe someday, or maybe it'd be cool enough just to do that. And then um, I signed with a company out of school and this, the uh, SAG strike happened at the same time. This is around um, basically 2001. And the, the place that I was signed, like super cool place. They were like, well, everyone's on strike. So we're not working for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? I want to like do something, yeah. you know, like I can't believe I'm not going to get to do anything. So one of my buddies was graduating from school and we were like, well, let's start our own production company and do some stuff. And somehow um, a friend called and he's like, yeah, Vans is trying to salvage a production that's gone wrong. I think you could fix it. And um, so I got this Vans gig that turned into more work than we could do for like 10 years. Wow. And um, it was really creatively satisfying, the people. Let's back up just a tiny bit. How did you know the, the friend who called you, and why did that person call you? He was a guy that I met at my first job in Austin, mm -hmm. um, Felipe Bascope. Okay. And yeah, yeah. He called me and said, uh, he's like, yeah, this production, a couple hundred thousand dollars in it, and it was just off the rails. He's like, I think you could fix it. And he was a creative director at the advertising agency I went to. And um, that was really cool at the time. So you had worked with him already, basically? Yes. Not not really directly. We just worked in the same agency. You know, mm -hmm. he, he was more senior than I gotcha. was. But he he and I were he and I both were Californians. Mm -hmm. So like we were both back in California. We were both in Austin working at that place, and then we were in California. And how did he know that you were looking for opportunities? Oh, I'd made it real obvious to everybody that I wanted to, <laughs> you know, direct some commercials and be filming stuff. I mean, right, I had left advertising at the agency to get on the other side to be in the production world and was trying my hardest to find projects. But from Felipe's side, he's like, I'm, I'm involved in this Vans project. It's a total mess. I know this guy that's like a true Californian. He's into surfing. He's into skating. He's into beach culture. He's into Vans culture. Like I'll call this guy. It's kind of like up and coming director. Like, like it makes Felipe look just as good mm -hmm, as sure. right as Bill. Like it doesn't matter if Bill's busy or not. Right. Like he's gonna call you. He Felipe. It wasn't Felipe's project. So it was. It was like he just knew about it. it was on his radar. Yeah. I mean, I we did we did, we worked our hardest and and hit it out of the park and uh, made out of the skate park. The <laughs> the snowboard park. It was a it was yeah. a, it was a snowboard thing. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah, it, it was awesome, man. I I wore Vans as well as a child, and um, like that brand really was my DNA at that time. And uh, it was really satisfying to be working with people that I working with athletes is a lot of fun. And you know, the transaction between these people, like um, as a director, is really satisfying. And for for a long time after that project, it was going somewhere interesting to mm -hmm. capture something really exciting, and then get to do the storytelling part of it. Yeah, there's, I, I know I've got a buddy who does a lot of um, surf spots and like they're not branded content pieces, but they're kind of like long form videos basically that aren't quite surf videos proper, but like for um, for like a billabong or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another it's not it's like a giant brand that I'm blanking on now. But yeah, like that lifestyle is really fascinating because like especially surfing, right? Like you're traveling all over the world. You're chasing the best waves and the best locales. Did you did you travel much, like, or was it more Southern California based? It was all traveling. Yeah, yeah, it was killer. I really, you know, like when you're younger, you want to travel all the time. Sure. Yeah, and Australia, Thailand, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot, a lot of Hawaii, yeah. which I'd grown up going there. So to go there for work felt really good. Did nine winters living in Hawaii. Wait, and, so can yeah. I guess kind of what happened between that and Age of Summer, your first movie? Of course. So you pretty much got swept up in this branded this advertising, rip yeah, oh. this riptide of <laughs> of filming this thing, and it mm -hmm. kind of started defining who you are. So you're doing advertising, and you're doing kind of lifestyle stuff and sports stuff, and every all the jobs you were getting, even if it's like for the U.S. military, it's like guys jumping out of a helicopter into the ocean, right? It's like all kind of tied together, and I, I imagine in those worlds, like narrative fiction storytelling isn't valued as much as like lifestyle great. just like catching the best wave basically at, with the right light or capturing people like as they are they're truthful like real sure. people yeah. Docu documentary work yeah. yeah you know and and 
being able to really understand where it was going to go next so you could be there to capture it, you know, like to be in the right spot with those sports. You really have to work with the athletes to be in the right place to capture it and then figuring out what's compelling about them and their story to, to make some content that I, I have a problem with that word, but I just, just rolled right out. Everyone does. It's okay. To, to tell their story. And I, you know, I don't know that everyone does. No, well, no everyone like, doesn't. Everyone yeah. doesn't. I'm so not like business people say people. that. Like, yeah. but directors don't like that word. Yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is that I have like a lot of snooty T4T friends who are like a little younger and they say content without batting an eye. <laughs> really? <laughs> Pred- right. Predator types. Yeah. Or no, no. Even just like, um, like a USC film school graduate would say, I'm going to direct some content. Yeah. And I think it, gen- I, I, maybe I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I think it is the most damaging thing to our industry. business and industry. <laughs> Have you that, heard Tom York talk about that? No, no. There's a really interesting our, uh, you know, podcast with him talking about how downfall of our civilization is. Is saying is, content, yeah, yeah. basically yeah. viewing it as content to yeah. fill up hard drives for yeah, for exactly computer companies. It is the shift from uh, uh, as artists admitting that what we are making is a commodity. Yeah. It's not artful. It's not meaningful. It's, it's like just filler. like how many uh, minutes of content do we have that represents a library that we can sell or and commodify? That is it. Yeah, yeah. content is. Such a fucking problem. So we won't say that anymore. <laughs> well, but, but we're all guilty of it now. Right? Okay, but so you were working in advertising. You started a whole company, Window Seat Pictures. Yeah, we started this company, Window Seat, based out of that van's job. And we had uh, a, a, long, a lot of years through the 2000s where we just had, our calendar was full with work. And we were doing one-hour TV shows for vans, uh, a bunch of them. This was before the internet took over. And so I enjoyed making these television shows and editing them and making them really compelling. And then everything started to shift towards the idea of web-based content and uh, webcasts f- for those those events and stuff that I was filming. The writing was on the wall that I was going to have to um, do shorter pieces and do webcasts. And um, that wasn't why I got into filmmaking. I wanted to make narrative you know, stuff that I wanted longer form stories, not shorter stuff. And so I kind of just went the opposite way and was like, how am I going to make a movie? And um, Joe McAleer and I uh, hooked up. Uh, he was producing some commercials I was directing, a uh, campaign I was directing. And he had done a handful of movies. And all of a sudden, it was really exciting to be working with a guy that actually had figured out the independent feature world to the point that he you know, had mm-hmm. five projects done. By the way, Joe Mac produced my first feature, The Hammer. Same guy. That's how I met Bill. That's right. So... Joe and I, Joe was really in, interesting to me at that point. He was like, oh man, I can, this guy can help me make a movie. And um, we figured out some financing opportunities and started, um, I started just reading scripts, you know. And, and, um, and how'd you get those scripts? Well, at the time we were working with one of the big talent agencies and they were coming through there. And then every, everybody I knew, I was like, who's got something to read? And so if I'm like a new filmmaker, could I just call up like CAA and say, hey, send me some scripts? Or how does that... Well, they've changed the game. Now they've work? got things that blacklist and different ways to do it. Uh, at the time, I was signed with WME and they were. You know, I was asking for everything that I could read so I could figure out what they thought was great. And then, then they would show me things that I could potentially throw my hat in the ring to be considered for. So you were signed with them as a producer? We were through their packaging department, yeah, as a producer. Okay. And um, we were also, we were we had a kind of a multi-prong approach with them where we were trying to produce movies. I wanted, we were, you know, I was actively producing and co-producing movies at the same time I was trying to direct a movie. I thought it would take me two years to get one going. It took about five. You know, life works out how it works out. It's fine. There were a lot of situations where you got a script. You're like, damn, this is like a good script. Let's do it. You know, we know some people that can finance it. Let's go make this movie. Let's attach some talent. And then the screenwriter all of a sudden is like, oh, actually, I want to direct the film. Or like, like yeah. there were so many opportunities. Like every time a good script comes around town, everyone wants it, right? Yeah. As soon as you shine a light on something and validate it by saying, I'll, I'll finance it, or I really want to direct it, please, please, please. Then all of a sudden they're like, oh. Okay, let's make sure there's no one else that wants to do this. <laughs> you know, and Great. I went through Thanks that. so much, guys. <laughs> yeah, it was like, there was one that I really wanted to do. You know, I sat in the room and basically you're 
pleading with them to let you take a shot at it. And they looked at my commercial reel and they're like, nothing on here makes any sense for this. And I was like, you know, I'm trying to make a break from the old and do something right. different and it's going to be challenging. So that took more time than I wanted it to take. And I think kind of the shocking thing about it is like, even if, if it's not like the financing that you're looking for, even if it's just like the good script that even that is hard mm-hmm. to, you know, to, to get. Yeah. It's really hard. Like your, your first feature ended up being this autobiographical story. Yeah. I never thought that would happen. That wasn't the plan. The mm-hmm. story has been in my head for many, many years, but I did not think that was going to be the way it went down. I, one. Yeah. I worked real hard to light up a couple different ones. But ultimately, like, I guess this is something we talk about all the time, but you have to prove to someone why you're the one that needs to direct this movie. Yeah. And if it's your story, if it's about surfers, if you're casting real surfers, you know, and teaching them to act, if you're doing all this stuff that is based on this giant, you know, years of experience that you have, then it's so easy to pitch yourself. If you're like, hey, I want to direct this movie about like this young girl in Namibia, right. you know, then people are like, why you? Yeah. yeah. I, I had locked in, like, I decided, I was going through this phase where everything I read, the third act was solved by someone shooting someone else. Like, mm-hmm. every single screenplay mm-hmm. had, like, it was like the movie, I thought it was all oh, so good, it's so right. good. And then, Hold on one sec, let me change my third act. Yeah. <laughs> it, okay. it was like, every single one, I'm like, I really like it. And then all of a sudden, the gun gets pulled, the person shoots the person, and the story's over. And I really, really had a hard time with that. I was like, I can't really get behind that. Which was, uh, you know... Wait, can you tell us why? It was just too easy? It's... One of my friends was murdered, and I saw all that go down. So I take the gunplay stuff really seriously, Mm -hmm. you know? And for, you know, if I'm going to spend years working on a project, and it's got to have a real good reason for someone capping somebody at the end. And I like watching stories where that happens all the time. But to be the person in charge of that project and really... And when it's not earned... Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to yeah. be really justified. So it well, wasn't. and your point of like, oh, th- there's a difference between gunplay in a movie and it solving the movie, right? Like, like one person killing another and that's the happy ending. Yeah, is a is a real decision, you know, for, as a storyteller to be oh. okay with that, right? Yeah, one of my favorite endings of a movie is Gran Torino, and this is a spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. And I know a lot of people hate that movie because the, the acting the kids is finally horrible. Get off his lawn! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you saw it, right? No, you haven't seen it. My friend Carrie made it though. Actually, have you seen it, Bill? Yeah, you haven't seen it, Matt? No, it's Oscar nominated. Yeah, there's a lot of Oscar nominated <laughs> movies I haven't seen. Can, Can I, I tell you the ending? Yeah, yeah. It's it's been ten years. I think I'm okay. Okay, so basically, uh, Clint Eastwood has established himself as this guy that is racist and goes and shoots at all these other people, gangs. He's pretty much like the ultimate Trump fan. Um, no offense, Trump fans. Um, but uh, he goes basically wearing this big jacket, like looking like he's packed with all sorts of weapons to go take down this like enemy gang that's bullying his, the kids that live next door to him. And he gets there and they see him like with his giant jacket packed with weapons and they just like fire, like pull out their like what semi-automatic rifles or whatever and just like gun him down. And then the cops show up and, it, you know, it's revealed he had like no weapons on him. And all those guys go to jail for just like shooting some old man that was walking on their, on their front lawn. Um, and so to me, that's, that's like a good ending, you know. It, it's a martyr it, for the scenario. Yeah. yeah. But also it's like the not using, not shooting someone and is how you win. Right. Yeah. Uh, and also they established from the beginning that he like hates life. He hate his, ever since his wife died, he's been depressed. So like for him dying is actually like, and a, a like, happy ending. Yeah, yeah, happy ending. These were genre movies, genre screenplays in a and I'm in an indie place, so mm-hmm. it was real challenging terrain to navigate. Thinking if I make this movie, it's not going to be received in the festival circuit. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, so I was trying to figure out which way to, which way to go. And my moral compass was telling me the whole time, like, you're not into violence, mm-hmm. so don't don't let that be the, you know, the third act. Um, and I still, I still struggle with that. I still read great things from like, ah, oh, that's how it ends. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, Wonder Woman was like one of my favorite movies of last year. And the third act is like atrocious. I think <laughs> it's pretty rough. <laughs> it's like literally some random guy turns out to be this God and he's like having a fight with Wonder Woman and she wins cause she's got like more love in her heart or something so dumb. 
right? <laughs> but it's so good. Like until then, uh, I still like the movie. But I mean, you're going to spend, uh, you know, three years of your life rehashing this thing, and um, you got to be really into it. So I was trying to do a different project that also focused on the water. Mm-hmm. It needed uh, two talent two actors to trigger the financing Mm -hmm. and that was going slower than it needed to. And then we switched gears. Can I ask you some numbers just to, because we love talking numbers on the podcast and feel free to say that you can't say it, but like, let's say you have a movie and you're trying to get an actress like a Shailene Woodley or even like someone like, um, uh, I don't know the answer to that one. Not a Shailene Woodley, but like, uh, I'm trying to think of like a Haley Steinfeld. Yeah. How much money do you offer someone like that to be in your movie? Mm, you have to call Joe. <laughs> yeah. The tricky stuff with that also is that, um, you know, there are SAG minimums for the different tiers of like how much your movie costs in total. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But the minimum, you're not offering anyone, like you're offering them like a million dollars. You're not offering them like $112,000 or whatever the minimum is. Sure. Right. Well, but depending on your your tier, right? Like SAG ultra low budget is two fifty total. So if your budget is over that, right? Say you need say Haley Steinfeld costs, you know, fifty thousand dollars, then and you can't make your movie for two hundred thousand, then not only does it cost you the fifty to pay Haley, and these are just arbitrary numbers, but also like it bumps you up into a bracket where everyone else becomes more expensive expensive as well. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the crazy thing when you get into the favored nation deals or the different tiers and all of a sudden your budget goes up a whole nother level. Everybody incrementally goes up. This happens in all the different categories. Right. Right. But let's say we have a listener that just their grandpa just died and they just inherited $2 million. Um, and they're like, oh, I can make my movie because I know I only need half a million dollars to shoot it. Mm-hmm. What star can I get for that one and a half million dollars? And then it might turn out not really anyone that matters, right? Yeah. Or can you always get someone great for one and a half million dollars? Well, there's a difference between great and like you'd probably get Christopher Walken to do a couple days on it, right? Yeah. Who who is great? Right. Right. Yeah. I think the screenplay should be the thing that attracts the talent rather than the paycheck. But well, so in your situation, when you were trying to attach two actors to that movie, Mm -hmm. you think the screenplay wasn't doing it? No. That wasn't the issue with that one. We had we had solved the female lead, and the man, it was actually another water thing. Go figure. And the physicality of the male lead was um, something that had to be it was a real thing. The person really needed to do things in the water, mm-hmm. and for it to be believable and authentic, um, it just couldn't be anybody. Um, so some of the people we talked to, fantastic actors, uh, said, "I think this is really cool." Right, cool but I can't do it. They were being honest. So it was a, it was a nice conversation to have with them. Can you be a little more specific in terms of like, is it that you needed them to surf really well or, um, this character had to, um, teach his daughter how to sail a, um, outrigger canoe. And, um, there was a bunch of sequences where they're going to be sailing this outrigger canoe from Island to Island. And, had to have the have the fit, the fit, the um, physicality that a person that could do that has, but you so you couldn't double it or cheat I, I things don't, at all. I'm not into that. Yeah, in the age of GoPro and all these other things, doubling is um, is not an option for me. Obviously, it would be in a big stunt sequence where you could mm-hmm. you put someone's life in danger. But for you reference surfing, so to talk about surfing or the sailing or. That stuff, I think you got the actors got to do it, which makes it more complicated for me. But the type of movies I want to make, I want to be really intimate with them. So this is interesting. So you, you mentioned GoPro. Would you say that because when when you say GoPro, I immediately and, and action sports ama- immediately, I'm thinking about like, oh, you're you know you're sticking cameras kind of all over the place. There's one on the board. There's you know you're kind of planting things different places, and it's a little more verite style is what I immediately kind of just start, my mind goes to. Would you say <laughs> that the influence of all this decade of shooting, lifestyle, verite, documentary, action sports influenced the way that you approached the scene work in your movie? I I think it for sure did, does. Um, but it's not a conscious thing. 
I think what happened was, is when I was at Art Center, I was, okay, so I come from the sports background where people are doing these crazy things that in the past they doubled people for them, you know, but now that we've thrown the doors wide open and said, no, look, these, these we can watch these dudes do it up close. We know what it looks like. So we can't go back now and use stunt mm-hmm. doubles. And I mean, sure, if you're James Cameron and you're doing motion capture stuff and on like that face level. replacing. Yeah, they did that in Blue Crush to some success, you mm-hmm. know, they had male surfers surfing for the girls. But I, I don't want to do that. There's girl surfers that can surf that well. Right. So this stuff was just, uh, you just want to have the option to be right up. And I mean, the, the close-ups of people's faces is how you can really get into movies, how you really connect with them. Mm-hmm. And that's what those cameras are allowing us to right. do, you know. I mean, at the best, it's not, they, in fact, those small cameras take away a lot of the, a lot of the nature stuff because they're so wide angle, you know, mm-hmm. like a lot of the, like stuff in the background goes away. So you just know it's that person doing that thing. Right, right. And, um... Did you find that in Age of Summer you were using a lot of GoPro or no, no, no? GoPro was referenced just because it was a game changer. Uh-huh. Um, I don't have any affiliation with them, or, sure. or you know, I'm, of course, I, my son has their newest camera and <laughs> all that. But I think that the story of that Nick Woodman's, like what he did, like he wanted, you know, he had that wrist-mounted camera, and then to where he's taken it is really amazing. But it really just drove the idea that my casting director, Nancy Foy, when we started casting, uh, we're back talking about Age of Summer, where a couple of the roles, there were surfers, and everybody surfs, but then there's people that are really good at surfing that have, like, it's a, a lifetime commitment and mm-hmm. or grew up doing it, you know. Um, and you can tell by the way they ride the board, the way they carry the board, uh, the way they paddle the board around. So... Nancy Foy, fantastic casting director, she signed on pretty early on this with me and said, introduced me to everyone in L.A. that said they could surf that was that age. Now, we were starting out, we're, this movie's made up of teenagers, so you're already at a disadvantage because you, you're dealing with people that haven't done a lot of things, so you, you, your pool is smaller that you're drawing from. Right. And she's, she's introduced me to people that said they could surf, and some of them were really good actors. And um, so I took these people out to the beach with a camera guy and said, all right, you surf, I'll surf too, Mm -hmm. and we'll be filmed. And um, really quickly you saw that they couldn't surf um, because they didn't have that, like they didn't, you know, they didn't catch any waves, first of all. But like if anyone says to a surfer, hey, I'll film you for an hour. If you go surf, that person's going to surf their brains out because they're auditioning. So, of course, they're going to go for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was... So the point was with Nancy Foy was that we needed people that could actually surf because we weren't going to double them. Nancy was like, oh, you could just double them. I'm like, no, actually you can't. That, that period because of the GoPro thing is mm-hmm. gone now. There's no there's no going back to body doubling mm-hmm. in a movie like this. So you ended up casting people mm-hmm. because of, due to their surf abilities, surfing abilities more than their acting abilities? Well, I wouldn't say more than. I worked real hard to find people that could play the roles that were in the screenplay, that mm-hmm. would be the character. Um, it was more like finding the characters in, in the real world. And then right. we engaged John Markland, a fantastic acting coach, <coughs> to work with them before we shot to work out the kinks. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I really like the idea of making a movie with real people mixed in with actors. Um, but, you know, we're in L.A., and I still wanted it to feel authentic, and I want to have a spirit, an independent spirit that tries to solve some of those problems. Mm-hmm. You know, the the community got really excited about having the community's people in the project, mm-hmm. uh, and they feel like part of the landscape in a way. Those those people do; they really fit in. You know, and it doesn't feel like a bunch of people plunked down in one place. It feels like they're from that zone because they are. Mm-hmm. And how does this acting coach work? I mean, we've talked about this before. Matt's wife has done some acting coaching. Um, but you just you say like, hey, here's a script. This is what I was thinking. Like, go get this actor or actress to get there. It, it could. For this, it was more about taking this group of people and having them be together for a little bit and doing just different exercises to get used to accelerate a relationship. So... Since, you know, the most, if I could have had more things in this movie, one of the things I would have asked for was more time to hang out before we shot mm-hmm. so people can actually develop friendships or 
or weirdnesses with each other so that that <laughs> stuff, you know, comes across better. Um, Did you change the script at all based on who you cast? Yes, but not as much in the pre-production, more how you edit the film. Basically, you take a look at these people's strengths once you've shot it, and you're like, okay, I need to cut around some of this person's weakness. I, I, for me, the, the, the characters were... In this movie, the, there were two characters that were that had to be very good at surfing because th that was what the boy was observing, was wanting to be in the water and wanting to be able to do that. And um, that was what I, you know, that that's this language I was talking about. As a surfer, you look at someone, you can tell that if you're watching someone surf, you say, oh, that guy's spent like years in the water, the way, he, the way he's able to handle himself. Kind of like the way someone would ride a horse. Mm -hmm. You know, and they'd be like, have a way with a horse. It's kind of the way that you, those people are in the water. So these characters had to be able to um, surf at around the camera and then talk in the water. Um, and and so you needed people that could really do it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a process question, actually, um, or a, a practical one. As a person who's shot so much in the water, because uh, I did a video for Ellen where we had a bunch of ladies surfing and i was like do i need to be in the water <laughs> as Should the director I the beach? yeah i was like what is the most practical way to communicate with people in real time right because normally if we're all on land i just walk over to them right um but also i've got a monitor with me and all that stuff so tell me just because there's a lot of really beautiful stuff where you guys are doing the thing where you like you dip below the water and then kind of like pop up and it's all very fluid and elemental and stuff so like how do you how do you communicate with your team how do you communicate with your actors where are you literally in in a, a ocean scene like this you're in a paddle boat no most of those i was in the just water just in the water yeah you yeah. know it's like it was it, 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 I, those are some of the most fun moments for me is like being in it you know in the thick mm -hmm. of it so with and, and are you monitoring how do you we had an airy camera in an inflatable boat Mm -hmm. and that has a really low freeboard so the camera can get real close to the water. Mm -hmm. And we had discussed different ways of jib arming the camera out, but ultimately um, that's just too much of a process to set up and tear down and these mm -hmm. things that eat your days. So it was mostly handheld. Mm -hmm. And so we had monitor work in the boat, but then when the camera's in the water housing, a surf, there's, you know, you can go two different ways. You can go like, surf housing or dive housing or a cinema housing mm -hmm. the cinema housing gave us a lot of problems mm -hmm. it was did like, it fog up n um it didn't it didn't get to that but the like we had a we had a moisture alarm uh -huh. which um once you put a camera in a water housing you're like pretty much set you got to work with that just yeah, take it back apart it takes a long time yeah it's, a, it's like a big plexiglass sort of thing and like pushing any button is like a real complicated thing where it's like it's it's this piston that kind of yeah all of a sudden you're just like oh the so, the utility of this camera has been minimized to one button yeah. record basically well that's where i mean the, the answer to your question is it's pre-production mm -hmm. we storyboard out the scenes mm -hmm. and said this is what i want this mm -hmm. is this is where i want to be this is, this is what i want to see even though you don't know what waves are coming what the weather is going to be like or anything right but you know like that's storytelling how i want that you know how I, how close I want to be to these actors, mm -hmm. and so we did a lot of testing with the mm -hmm. surf housing. And uh, the fellow that I worked with on this, Darren was the cinematographer, and Ryan was the water operator. I've known Ryan for a long time; he's one of the best surf shooters around. And um, so, you know, I would be—I knew what lens was on the camera, and I was with him in the water, basically, you know, shoulder surfing him. Mm -hmm. So what does shoulder surfing mean? It's an editorial term mm -hmm. for when you drive the editor nuts by sitting on his shoulder. Oh, gotcha. And, but it works in cinematography. Sure, so, sure. So, you know, when I call it side car right? okay. So you're like just looking over his shoulder the whole yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was, yeah, I'm just sitting with him. And, and are you on a surfboard? Are you in the boat? Are you in a wetsuit? Are you treading water? What is it? Treading water. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we there was a little bit of everything. There was times I was sitting on a surfboard, and but the most fun stuff was that we intentionally cast um, the leads were not water people. They didn't serve. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea that the characters wants to learn to do this. And um, so most of the time I was with him. And when we would shoot on shoot him, I would go underwater, hold mm -hmm. my breath. 
and we would film him and then I would come <laughs> right, back. Right, because you have to get out of the shot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like when we're editing it, it's like <laughs> it was usable as soon as I was underwater and then I would pop back up. And that was because of water safety. Uh-huh. It was so I could communicate with him. And I literally was holding his surfboard the way I wanted it to be to the waves as the as the waves came through. Because obviously the ocean is very powerful and this kid didn't know how to hold himself in place. And that was a lot of fun for me because mm-hmm. you were, I knew I'm looking back at the beach and there's like 30 people on the beach and people with megaphones. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm, I'm just like, there's no way I could be there doing what I'm doing now. Right. Right. And I'm looking at Ryan. I'm like, do we get what we needed? And he's like, we got it. We got it. I'm like, okay, one more. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's sure. make sure, you know, <laughs> you know, we intentionally filmed it in front of a lifeguard headquarters mm-hmm. in front of a lifeguard tower. Mm-hmm. Had, Did you close down the beach? No, but we shot it right after the um, summer had ended and everyone had gone back to school. Mm-hmm. So we didn't want an empty beach, but we didn't want a fully, you know, mm-hmm. going off beach. Because right, it's a period piece. You don't want people with like super modern stuff on. Correct. So we we had it right in front of all the safety and then we still had to follow these rules where we had to have, we had to declare that there were water days and we had to have lifeguards and we had a jet ski and we had a boat and a lot yeah. of... Like, yeah. and it was only four and a half feet deep. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> it was kind of yeah. crazy. So, yeah, so you're standing, like you're not even treading water. Yeah, you're just like. It, and it was yeah. crazy. So we wanted, to, I wanted to be in the water all the time. Like, no, we can't do that today. Like the condition, it would be like hot and glassy. And like, mm-hmm. oh no, you're not scheduled to do water. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get to it. Um, well, we should probably wrap things up pretty soon, but I want to ask just like, so you're, today's Wednesday. The movie came out on Friday. Five days ago, how do you feel? Are you relieved? Are you stressed? Are you depressed? Are you excited? All of them. Are you stoked? (laughs) I did stir for hands. Yeah, I'm totally stoked, bro. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I I I look at it like it's like a big accomplishment to you know like a bucket list thing that I keep going back to that because there's a lot of anxiety around Mm -hmm. the sale stuff and I want things to happen that probably won't with certain aspects of that and um, wondering where it'll take me and what what next leg of the journey is but um, as a filmmaker it's real satisfying to have something out there that's going to be there for a while and um, just keep putting that back in the forefront yeah I think something really valuable about making a movie about a specific world we talked about this earlier is that now Age of Summer is like the definitive movie about Hermosa Beach in the 80s you know or junior lifeguards or so the more specific your movie can be the I feel like the longer it'll stand the test of time yeah um Bill let me ask if you could go back and do it over again is there anything you would change or want to tell yourself at the top of your first feature? Yeah, like I said earlier, I think it would be good to workshop with the actors more mm-hmm. and really try to get more physical. I think one of the challenging aspects of shooting with young people is that they have their um, guardians with them, and there's a lot of like there's a lot of layers to actually get to know the people. Mm-hmm. So I wish we could have done more of the Markland esque, like uh, um, working with each other to learn more about each other, to be able to communicate and draw more out and fi- find the boundaries of what's funny and what's, you know, just like figure these people out Mm -hmm. because you're jumping right into it on day one and and like you're figuring out how to communicate with these people and they're figuring out how they communicate with each other on screen. And so more time to get to know the people as, as a group Mm -hmm. doing stuff together that, that, you know, shared experience that you can use when you try to capture that on screen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's tough. That's what I hate about commercials. Like so many times I'm meeting the actors like for the first time on the shoot day. And I'm like, hey, be my best friend, Harrison yeah. Ford. And then <laughs> a month later, he has no clue who I am. Two days later, he has no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes later, he's yeah. like, uh, can I have a coffee, please? Yeah, who's that guy? Can I, I have one final question? So you're as a director that's pitched movies and a producer that's listened to pitches, do you have any final words of advice to people that want to get like their indie film going? You know, what do you look for in a director and their project and what do you avoid? I want someone that totally understands the world they're going to take us to. And that you really look at that person as they're talking to you and you, you see through all the layers and you're like, yeah, I really think that dude's authentic and can take us someplace that we haven't been and someplace mm-hmm. unique. I'm inspired by someone with a genuine like, zest for life. And um, if that, that person takes me there, 
um, then I feel like I'm investing my time wisely. Cool. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Lust for life with Bill Kiley. And don't yeah. be a poser, I guess. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't you tell me that? Yeah, yeah. yeah you finally Before dropped I... a little bit of surfer lingo for me. I appreciate it. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, that's awesome. <laughs> and so what's next? Do you, do you know what's going on now? We're doing, um, we've optioned a couple of screen, uh, books. Uh, Tom Wolfe's last book, Back to Blood. Uh, just We closed the deal right after he passed away. A very interesting process. Oh, wow. Uh, it's a story about Miami and the different tribes that exist in Miami. Oh, cool. uh, we, we're so we're trying. We're writing the pilot for that series. The idea of doing a series is very interesting to me. Like a TV show. Yeah. And so you're kind of doing it on spec, and then you would have to pitch it and sell it. Correct. It's that's a pretty awesome story. The idea of the series is very um, very exciting and very scary at the same time. The idea of making that much. Sure. Living it's in the content. world for so long. I yeah. didn't say it. You did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's another one uh, called The Chalk Man, which is a, a novel out of the UK, which is um, kind of a, a, a um, Stranger Things-esque without the sci-fi aspect, a little more of a horror aspect. Uh, I'm working with the BBC trying to get that one off the ground. So those are two things the company's doing. And then I have another feature I'd like to, I'd like to make, the one that I was trying to do beforehand. Mm-hmm. But I'm confused about how to how to really make a feature stick out from all the television show series sure. stuff yeah. yeah i mean even if you look at netflix which uh, unfortunately increasingly is the only game in town you know the they're trying they're, they're spending more money and they're really like revamping the way that they do features um and no one is talking about it no one cares about their features it's crazy right. they they actually have a lot of responsibility as the as the the leader in the space to educate and to um, help filmmakers, you know, have not, not like not like do us any favors or anything, but to to keep the feature art form alive. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and um, it just feels like there's so much on the table. It's it's interesting to be so revolutionary in serialized storytelling, uh, not serialized content. Uh, serialized storytelling and not focus on features at all you know like yeah. that's that was the cornerstone of their business and like Amazon I think is doing a better job at it but also it feels like so much of their catalog is like a 24 where it's like oh yeah of course these filmmakers are all awesome we've known that for 20 years you know yeah I think um, that's my rant you know how like you can go you know, when you look at Instagram too much now, it tells you you're all caught up. Mm-hmm. I think like, <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of depressing when it says that. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing sadder. I yeah. think they need to do that with like the series where they're like, okay, you've you've binged like you've four seen shows in ones. a row. No, yeah. you've you've watched four shows. Now take a break and watch a movie, watch a and movie. then come back yeah, yeah. to finish out the series. Yeah, because yeah, it's weird how I'll watch like three one hour episodes, but I'm like, oh, an hour and, and a half movie. Yeah. Good. But I will say, has the time. <laughs> just from doing this podcast, I'd say, wouldn't you say a majority of our guests who directed TV have directed at least one feature first? By majority, I mean more than 50%. Yes, certainly. I'm trying to think of one uh, of many directors who've only done serialized content and not, um, there I said, I mean, Matt uh, Pollock, maybe. Pa- Pollock and Tony. Oh, yeah, Tony. But, but I think and so many people, like, yeah. yes, the, there is a question of the feature marketplace, which is like a whole you know, topic onto itself, but the usefulness of a feature as a filmmaker to me seems still really obvious. Yeah. Th- there's a trend of like, we talk to a lot of first time filmmakers or first time feature filmmakers who are like, yeah, I made this awesome movie. And as a result, I'm making all these cool TV shows as well. Right. And yeah, if Amazon a did, common, common did a show about surfers in the eighties, like yeah, you, you're the be, guy who gets the call. Yeah. You'd be like, hey, why would you not hire me? So um, maybe like adapt to Dogtown as a serialized show, right? Yeah. It's not a bad idea. I mean, no. <laughs> Bill, you just lit up there a little bit. <laughs> I, I'm getting him a treatment, Matt, by Monday. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like the idea of this other stuff too. I mean, this this Tom Wolf thing is very interesting to yeah. me and it's it's um, dynamic and there's not a, there's a sailboat in it. Can mm-hmm. someone shoot there. someone in the end? There is gunplay, but um, 
you know, at this point I'm not directing it. I'm producing it. So I'm developing it. Um, well, if you're looking for a director, our pal Charles Hood is great and uh, has sailed his whole life. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Wait, for what? For the Tom Wolf book? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I got the water thing out of my system to a certain degree with yeah. this one. So I'm ready to like, but I do agree, like for me, if I'm going to be, you know, do so many days in one place, I really want to love where we're filming. Sure. And yeah. I love being outside. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. All grip, no electric. <laughs> um, well, cool. So if we want to find out more about the movie, we can just Google age of summer, right? Yes, you can. Uh, do you have a website or a hub of any sort that you're trying to direct people to? Check out agesummer.com. Uh, go on iTunes and look up Age of Summer. And watch Pay the to download it. Yeah. yeah. And windowseat.com is the... Company website could use some work. But yeah, windowseat has been my company for 15 years. Uh, Bill, do you tweet? Is there any uh, other way people who want to keep track of you? It's okay if you don't. I think the only thing I really do is Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you want to share your Instagram or is it more of a private one? Oh, it's just my name, and maybe it'll be public, or maybe won't when you go there. Right. But yeah, Bill, Bill Kiley. Kiley. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pictures of my children. Oh, awesome. Well, um, you, you know, can... one of our listeners told me to stop posting pictures of my kids <laughs> on my Instagram. <laughs> so business oriented. It really does make me laugh. Uh -huh. um, it's so funny. You he's do. like he's like a big fan of the show too. Um, yeah. Um, before we say goodbye, uh, we're gonna go into our final segment we call unpaid endorsement unpaid endorsements. um so bill you reminded me of one of my all-time fave viral videos it was a, a the birthday boys a sketch group that had a tv show on I, ifc there for a minute did a video before they had the show called pool jumpers and it was like dogtown and z boys like 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 a documentary but it was about um these renegade kids who invented the sport of catching a ball and jumping into a swimming pool and it like all the needle drops are perfect it's like a mixture of dslr and super eight footage and it is so friggin' good i love it so much um so pool jumpers is um my unpaid endorsement cool <laughs> um well i have uh i have a drone in case you guys didn't know i've been flying it without a license for a long time and I wanted to get licensed and I was talking to Matt Barber, a previous guest who also has a drone and he told me that there's this video on YouTube called the Free Drone Certification Study Guide by Tony and Chelsea Northrup. Just this hour and a half video, hour and 43 minute video. You watch it, then you take the test and you'll pretty much pass. He pretty much wow. tells you how to pass the test. Um, you might have to watch it a couple times, but uh, I took a bunch of practice tests after I watched it and I passed them also. Uh, check it out because it's really freaking complicated if you try to figure it out on your own and if you want to pay for a course it's like 300 bucks so check out this video it's got like 85 percent of what you need to know which is enough to pass the test and then i want to for the time being unendorse the bug assault gun uh it's re really ruined my marriage um it was this gun that you shoot a fly with that with salt that was recommended a little while ago, and I endorsed it even before I used it because people loved it so much. Bill, I still love it. Bill has two. We have two. We have one on the sailboat. Bill loves it, but uh, every time I use it, I blast salt into the air, and it gets on something my wife is consuming, whether it's a glass of wine or a plate of food, and she uh, says, "No way, she can eat it anymore." And I was like, "Who cares if there's a little salt on your food?" And she says, well, the salt is like literally bouncing off of a fly onto my food. I have to throw this all away. Yeah. And it's been really rough on my relationship. And all these flies I'm shooting are just like flying away right after I shoot them. So uh, you're giving me that gun? Bill has recommended. Well, I'm going to try your recommendation of hi Himalayan salt. <laughs> the chunky Himalayan mm -hmm. sea salt. Uh, yeah, right now I'm using like kosher, Morton's kosher salt or something. Is, is kosher salt, is, is that bigger than... The fine, like iodized salt. I, don't which, know. Which, which I actually one is might be salt? using the iodized one. There's like the girl with the umbrella. Mm -hmm. I wonder if maybe Morton's. you need to. You should yeah. change your your grain. Yeah, you need chunkier salt. Yeah, though. yeah. Okay. And then you just got to make sure your wife's wine is not underneath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Bill and I witnessed uh, this. <laughs> yeah, it's <was laughs> criminal, and it was um, impending divorce. 
Well, we'll we'll just say Orin is drinking salty wine while we're recording. Right, this and I'm sick, but I'm still drinking that wine so that you won't be upset that we wasted it. Maybe maybe throw some honey in there as well. It'll help out. <laughs> um, okay, Bill, what do you got? I went into the Mollusk Surf Shop here on Sunset today. Those dudes are real cool. Real cool here in Silver Lake. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I you know I think in that that shop which is based out of New York, I think, and they've got no San Francisco. And one here, and then one in Venice. They do a good job of supporting what surfing's all about. Yeah, it seems you every time you walk in, you're like, oh, maybe I should surf. This is cool. <laughs> yeah, the poster. We had a funny thing happen with the poster. Um, we there's a surfboard on the poster that's mine. The poster uh, of your movie of Age, Age of, of Summer. Summer. Yeah, and it's this 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 one you know surfboard company out of Hawaii, and I found all these people online were excited and and mad that i took the logo off the surfboard and mm-hmm. i went into Molox today and saw they had this campbell brothers line of surfboards and surfing community is um opinionated and strong and they do a lot of beautiful things too so that shop mollusk is uh, my unpaid endorsement cool awesome well thanks so much bill yeah thanks if you uh, want to ask bill any more questions we are happy to forward them to him if you want to ask us questions give us your comments tell us what you think Email us at justshootapod at gmail.com. Uh, you can find us on all social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're at Just Shoot a Pod. On Twitter, I'm at Smitey Pileg. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlo. This episode was edited by Christopher Robert Gray. Our producer is Madeline Rosewatt, and our webmaster is Ewan Williams. Uh, and the music you're listening to right now is by the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.